Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for joining me here this evening on a, quite a wild and windy night. Um, and I should perhaps explain, Gresham College is 1597, by the way, and uh, um, so very late in the, in the 16th century, but um, it is an interesting institution. It's uh, Christopher Wren and Robert Cook were both Gresham professors, and uh, I'm very privileged to be the first professor of environment, which is only the second new professorship in 450 years. Um, do the arithmetic. And I should explain too that uh, the work on silent witness uh, arose because I do occasionally do work for the police, uh, tracing dead bodies for real in rivers, um, usually in murder inquiries. And uh, I did, I think, say to, to Patricia earlier that you asked for the wrong lecture tonight. <laughs> that, that one really packs me. Um, disturbingly, sometimes people actually take notes. <laughs> Anyway, um, thank you for inviting me. I, I do feel very honoured to be invited. I, I picked up from somewhere, I think, that Karl Marx had lectured here. I don't know if that's right. But that's not in this building. But uh, um, I, I said to my husband, uh, um, you know, this is really extraordinary. Did you ever, in your wildest dreams, think that uh, I'd be speaking in the same, to the same body as as Karl Marx, and he looks at me rather slowly and he said, actually, you haven't featured very much in my wildest dreams. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> anyway, so, tonight I'm going to talk about managing the water environment. Is this a hopeless cause? And um, uh, let, me, uh, let me start off by showing you this image. I'm guessing people, some people might recognise where this is. This is in England, I'm afraid. It's Tewkesbury, it's Tewkesbury <coughs> on Room 7. And um, the reason I show it is, uh, firstly, because it's a, an interesting image of uh, a flooding, but also um, back in 2007, so just a decade ago, I was the technical advisor to Gloucestershire County Council when they were trying to sort out the mess that followed um, the, the flooding of 2007 in, in the Seven Basin. And um, I know, I, I've got a minute or two longer than I thought I had, so I will just tell you a little story about this. Um, after that event, so it was a very serious, very serious event, there were a quarter of a million people lost their water supply for anything up to three weeks. And I can tell you, in Britain, that's, that we are a rather um, restrained community, I would say, and certainly the Gloucestershire community is, um, they were pretty cross about that. Um, but afterwards, um, the County Council set up some, um, some discussion groups in various villages around in, in the county for people who had been flooded to come and kind of unload themselves with their county councillor. And um, this, the, the event was, took place in July, and this was um, at the end of September these things were taking place. And uh, I heard a, a story from this, which is that one of the things that has most moved me uh, about the management of water, and that really brought it home to me in a, a rather gut-wrenching way, there was a, a, a young lad, he was about 15, who came in to see one of the county councillors, and he said, um, uh, I wonder if you can help me. He said, I'm, my mother and my younger brother and I are living in a mobile home in, in Gloucester because our house was flooded, the council house was flooded, and my mother's lost it. He said, my brother and I haven't had a hot meal since July. Can you arrange it for, me to, for, for us to have a school dinner? He said. And I, I really think that kind of thing makes you aware that managing water is a really important thing. It's a very uh, fundamental part of our society. So, with that in mind, um, let's, let's move on. Many of you will have seen these kind of images before, I think. Um, I, will this work? Oh, no, that doesn't work. Um, there we go. This is um, one of the reasons why water supplies and other aspects of the water environment are under pressure. You can see what it is. It's a track of the temperature changes since the 19th century, globally, based on the best data we have. And I think you can see from that, I'll see if I can get it to play again. I can't get it to play again. Um, there we go. So it starts in the 1850s, and I think you can see what's happening. The, uh, the circle here, is the, the magical 1.5 degrees centigrade, which in Paris, in most countries, not in the US, but many countries agreed that they would try and um, constrain likely climate change within that range. 
And that's a fairly powerful signal, again, about some of the pressures on the water environment. And I'll come back to some of them in a minute. Um, one of them, of course, will be water stress. And you may think here in Scotland, and certainly tonight, that you're not a, an environment under water stress. This is uh, forecast water stress by 2040, and it includes things like uh, climate change, population growth, and so on. And you can see here that here the, the England and Wales are bundled in together, um, which may upset some of you, I'm sure. But, uh, and you can see we are medium to high risk because the ratio of withdrawals to the supply of available water is actually not very high. Um, and of course, large areas of the rest of the world are under extreme press, uh, extreme stress, including, of course, the, much of the United States, lots of um, Asia, Central Asia, North Africa, Mediterranean, Australasia, and uh, parts of South, uh, South America and South Africa. So lots of stresses there, and um, uh, partly driven by climate change, partly driven by population growth. Um, again, here we've got another indication of something that's related to the water environment, um, that's likely to be driven by climate change. It's, uh, it's, if you watch it, it's a series of observations taken from space by NASA showing the North, uh, the North Pole uh, ice caps if you just keep your eye on this area here, this is the Northwest Passage, and you can see why cruise ships are now starting to offer interesting destinations uh, coming through uh, into the Northwest Passage, which earlier they would not have been able to reach. So we've got this series of sort of seasonal changes, uh, and, but generally a reduction, uh, diminution, sometimes suddenly, in the amount of sea, floating sea ice in the Arctic. That, of course, the implication of that, just about to finish that, I think the implication of that is quite clear, again, in the matter of the water environment, there are other types of flooding. This one gives me a certain amount of satisfaction, actually, because it's, it's Florida, and you can see here that uh, the, the pattern of Democratic and Republican voting got President Trump into office, and you can see here the simulation of what might be the situation uh, with six metres of sea level rise, which he loses quite a lot of his constituents. <laughs> I make no further comments. Okay, um, so uh, these kind of environmental implications are one of the, uh, a number of suite of environmental changes, which I, I put up here a, a diagram produced by the Stockholm Environment Institute, very well respected institution, but the, um, the research was done in 2015. What the diagram shows is a range of environmental characteristics around the side here, and the, the portions of the pie here show you how serious in 2015 they thought the issue was. So, for example, if you look at um, uh, something like nitrogen, biochemical flows of nitrogen, there was thought in 2015 to be an extreme problem arising from that. Um, there's also a problem arising in terms of genetic diversity and in changes in, in uh, land use. Um, I find this, this diagram quite interesting, despite the fact that there are a few things here which I <coughs> felt they didn't know about, um, and, and certainly atmospheric aerosol loading is something <coughs> That's evolution with particulates. It's something that's reached the headlines recently uh, as a very serious matter. Um, the, if you look at the climate change, it was thought to be not that serious, and freshwater use, uh, not a problem at all. Now, I would disagree with this as an analysis, actually. I think it's probably uh, the analysis would, would be different if it were done today, uh, three years later. Um, and I think um, we have far more to, uh, far more to do about those two areas in particular. But we should note that water is a part of a much wider set of environmental challenges that we are looking at. Now, where do these challenges come from? Well, I've got a number of things up on the diagram here that are affecting the way we manage the water environment and indeed other kinds of environmental uh, uh, parameters as well. The, uh, the ones I pick out in particular around here, we've got 
uh, and I'm referring perhaps particularly to Great Britain here, as it would be the case in many developed countries, we have population growth, obviously that's a, uh, an international challenge, there will be 9 billion of us soon. Um, in Britain, certainly, we have an, an aging population. We have huge growth in cities, concentrations of people with high demands for water. We have, here we are, this with water, other kinds of resources and energy availability. Um, we'll come back to that one in a minute. We've got also, uh, oh, so we've got climate change and habitat destruction as uh, an interesting challenge. And we've got, in some cases, aging infrastructure, pipes, roads, reservoirs, and so on. Um, but we've also got some opportunities here. We've got massively improved global connectivity over the last few years. We can do stuff here electronically in terms of communicating with instruments and with um, control systems and with each other in a way that we could not have done even five, six years ago. We've got, in, in addition to that, on the horizon, we've got a range of other technologies, which I'll talk about in a minute. But a very wide range of other technologies coming through very, very quickly that are potentially providing some solutions to some of the problems of water management. Um, just pick up this one, value placed on heritage and culture. This is a, an interesting thing too. Uh, water features, if you like, uh, such as reservoirs, are very much valued by people. But on the other hand, many uh, alterations to the water regime are seen as a threat to heritage. So it's a kind of double-edged sword here in the way um, we look at the water environment in terms of the, uh, the value we place on it as a, as a heritage artifact, if you like. We like our natural environment, but we also like water features that are constructed by people. So there are some opportunities there and some challenges. Now, I'm going to do a little digression here. I don't know what happened in Scotland, but in the south of England, uh, in London, in earlier last year, um, there was a big march. I don't know if any of you saw this on the television or whether there was anything here in Scotland, was there? Well, it was quite a big, it was quite a big thing in, uh, in England. It was a part of a, a worldwide move, movement of people who were promoting the importance of science and, and technology. And here you can see them gathering outside the Houses of Commons. And I just wanted to show you some of the pictures uh, that, that are relevant to the discussion we're having now. Um, quite a lot of them were about climate change, the, the, the banners that people were carrying. ICE has no agenda, one of them says, and chi climate change is not a Chinese hoax. People also get very excited about it, like this chap here, and it's clearly pretty cross about whatever's going on here. Um, so this is a big movement, and um, there we are, ice cream for actions. Um, so climate change is real, teach science. Ice has no agenda, it just melts. Um, but some of them I like even better, this one. What do we want? Everything based science, when do we want it? After peer review. <laughs> so kind of, scientists are quite kind of, you know, modest about pushing their own agendas. I like that one. Um, here's another one. Science is beautiful, science is fun, science is useful, science is for everyone, though it needs decolonizing. Again, I like the sort of, you know, the reservations of the, the, the strong message there. Um, how about this one? My money is a scientist, scientists are badass. <laughs> Whatever that means. Um, and um, here we are, that's my favourite. Um, so, we, um, here's one, the final one. If you're not part of this group, you're part of the precipitator. I don't have any chemistry in the audience. Um, you can see, actually, she's got a Trump thing on the grass jar here alternate facts. Uh, so the point about this is that science is pretty important in managing water, and uh, perhaps that's not always recognised enough, which is the theme to which I'll return in a minute. So, ooh, I'm going to show you that. Um, I was going to ask you to shout out for me what you think in the water environment has to be managed. Floods I'll give you and droughts I'll give you, but what else? Shout. Sewage. Sewage, yeah. Quality. Water quality, yeah. Acidity. Yeah. Another dimension of water quality. Anything else? Access. 
access. Oh yes, that's interesting. Yeah, access and <coughs> recreational opportunities actually. Which I don't mean that in access if you're in a dry country. Oh, I see. You mean access to water, to, to drinking water. Yes. Yeah. So you've got issues about the way the water is distributed. Yeah. There's also, of course, access in the sense that water is often a recreational facility as well. Nothing else. Plastic pollution. Pollution. Yeah. Ecology. Keep going. Use of energy in energy, yeah, anything else? Possible rationing. Yeah, okay, so potential limitations on use because we're running out. Anything else? The decoration and fountains. <coughs> okay, so the man-made use of water as a decorative feature. Yeah, anything else? Distribution itself. Distribution itself. We're missing one really big thing you have to pick up. Desalination. Leakage, desalination, anything else? Farming. Right, food. Okay, now, um, there's a few others on here. You picked up some of them, and I've not got all of the ones that you spoke about on here. Flooding, drought, water supplies, we've got there, um, water quality, agriculture, fisheries, navigation, hydropower, <coughs> ecology, somebody did mention. So there's actually a lot of things here that have to be managed concurrently together. You've got to get them all right in some sort of way. Now, um, Solutions normally involve something called innovation, and I'm going to talk about that quite a bit this evening. But it's generally recognised that in order to tackle some of these environmental challenges, we need excellent science, talked about, and we need some kinds of innovation in order to address the situation that we're in, which in some cases is getting rather critical, as the access to water issue uh, slide demonstrated. So what is Innovation then. Anybody want to hazard a guess? What do we mean by innovation? IT. IT could be. Yeah. Thinking in new ways. Thinking in new ways. Yeah. Commercialization. So is that? Commercialization. Commercialization. Right. Commercialization of what? Ideas. An idea. Okay. Any other? Recycling of wastewater. Okay, that would be an example of an innovation, certainly. Yeah. <coughs> we are doing some of it, but there are new ways of thinking about water, you're absolutely right. Surprising new advances. Sorry, say that again? A surprising new advance. A surprising new advance. Okay, something that happens that we can think about and suddenly bubbles up. I think you're all right. Um, I think the, the gentleman over there had an interesting point, which is the one I've got in red here. So we know that it's bringing in something for the first time, transforming something, a new product, maybe something different, something not previously imagined, as I think somebody in the middle there said. But here, we've got, we call an innovation, an idea must be replicable at an economical cost and must satisfy a specific need. It's actually got to be able to be used. It's not just enough to have the idea. You've got to be able to do something with it. I thought the last thing on, because I'll come back to this in a minute, sometimes people think that innovation could be just to, to do with the way we pay for things. And, that's an interesting question. Um, it's not usually, uh, people might say that's not really an innovation, but we'll come to that uh, social aspects of innovation in a minute. Okay, so in theory, that's what innovation is. So here, we, here we've got an innovation, a phone track. Okay, a water company's latest innovation. Um, okay, so that's not an innovation. Um, but there are companies out here, if any of you have got large sums to invest, you may be aware of Gartner, which is an American punditry company. They, uh, they advise investors, and they do it by spotting the upcoming technologies. Every year they publish an analysis on the web. You can, see, you can find it for free. Um, if you want the detail, it's more complicated. But they took, they're called Gartner. And this is their analysis for 2016. Now, you might think, I'm two years out of date. And I'll show you 2017 in a minute. But the thing is, you might actually recognise some of the things on here, um, like 3D printing, for example. I don't know if people have come across that. Or um, uh, advanced machine learning is another thing you may have heard of. But there are things on here that most of us probably have not heard of. Uh, if you come to 2017, you'll be even more um, troubled by what is being shown, uh, possibly. I mean, I don't know what mesh app and service architecture is, nor do I know what conversational systems are. I think it might be something to do with social media. But um, some of these other things, intelligent things, perhaps we can 
guess what that is. It's to do with the, the kind of sensors and information you have attached to individual objects in your house, in your pocket, in your phone, for example, uh, machinery in a sewage treatment plant or on a pipeline. So all sorts of data generating things, big data is being attached there. And at the moment, there's a lot of money going into some <coughs> sort of blockchain, which again, you might, some of you might have heard about. It's not just to do with bitcoins, which people know what bitcoin is? <laughs> yeah, don't invest, don't you really. uh, But blockchain is the technology behind that that links transactions together. It doesn't have to be money, it could be water, for example. So that's Gartner Innovations. Now, the reason for showing you that is I want to show, also want to lead you to this, which is what they call the Gartner hype cycle for new technologies. Now, you can see what we've got here. We've got how visible is a particular technology, and along the bottom here, we've got time. And what you say with a new technology is, first of all, somebody has the idea. It's invented, okay? And you get this trigger, and everybody goes, golly, that's absolutely brilliant. I want some. Give me some of it. And so it goes up in visibility to something they call the peak of inflated expectations. Which is very quickly followed by the trough of disillusionment, <laughs> where you say, doesn't really work. And then you get the slope of enlightenment and finally, finally the plateau of productivity, when you know some part of it works, in, uh, partly the way you expect it. Now, the, why this is important is that Gartner actually identify those things which they think are going to be important and they place them on this curve to help their investors. And this, is, this tells you whether individual technologies are coming or going in their opinion. <coughs> so if you, if you look carefully, you can see, for example, that something like the connected home. How many of you have got a, an Alexa in your kitchen? Anybody got an Alexa? Oh, yes, you see we've got... Three or four people, five, half a dozen people. I've got one in my kitchen and I say to it, what's the weather like today? And it says it's raining at your address, which is kind of smart, but it's actually smarter than that. It's smarter than me because I haven't yet quite worked out how to use it. And it doesn't yet switch my lights on, which uh, my husband does that. So, uh, um, but this is, this is the idea that your home can be connected to anything. You can control it with your phone, you don't have to get out of bed in the morning, you know, open the curtain, switch the heating on, you know, do the toast, feed the dog, whatever it might be. Um, but you can see this is at the peak, the peak of inflated expectations, or it was in 2017. It, there's about to be a crash, and then later on, it'll come up here again. So if we look at the things on here, which are innovations, you, obviously, you don't invest down here if, you've got, if you're smart. I don't even know what smart dust is or does, but um, <coughs> quantum computing, you know, you'd have to be in it for the long term because you've got to get through that back down there and up here before you really make any money out of it. That's the point. And they, they put time scales on these things as well. So some things take uh, the plateau, which is over here. The plateau will be reached in less than two years when there's a grey blob and actually there are no great blobs, I think, there at the moment. Um, and some of these triangular ones, it says here, more than 10 years, autonomous vehicles. I don't think so, actually. I think that's going to be much sooner than that. In fact, already elements of that happening now. So they're not always right. However, what we have to think about is what, <clears throat> what are the implications of some of these innovations for managing water? And I want you to have that in mind. These are, by and large, technical innovations. Things to do with gadgetry, okay, but not all of them, but a lot of them are things to do with gadgets. So things to do with controlling pumps, pipes, monitoring what's going on, uh, collecting data together so we can see how a city's water supply is running, for example, that kind of thing. Um, so these are potentially relevant innovative technologies for the water sector. Now, <clears throat> some of these things uh, as we can see on here, happen very, very quickly. I already touched on Alexa. This is a nice diagram produced by uh, the company Daimler with Bosch, another company. This is an urban future where, as it says here, the vehicle comes to the driver, not the other way around, and autonomous.
autonomous cars on the road by 2020. Now, autonomous cars now are already on the road, actually, so it's, it's uh, uh, slightly out of date. What I want you to think about is what's the water equivalent of that? What kind of changes, big changes, might occur in the water sector? It's a rhetorical question, I won't expect an answer now. But you have to think about a system where somebody somewhere else puts water in, treats and collects water together, puts it into a system, delivers it to you. This is just the drinking water element uh, of this. In your house, you drink it uh, and you discharge your waste and it goes away somewhere else and somebody treats it. Now, there could, of course, be different ways of doing that, and we'll come to one or two of those in a minute. And in theory, they could, those kind of changes might happen quite quickly. Now, one of the reasons they might happen quickly is because of these technologies that have developed <coughs> extremely rapidly. So I'm sure you all know what these things are. These are in your car, GPS systems, or your phone, satellite imagery, you know, digital cameras we know all about, all of these other things, drones, this drone up here, the web, miniature sensors, the internet, and the internet of things. Again, you can sense things, you can monitor what's going on, the flow in the planet, the quality of water and so on, instantly using a tiny sensor and assemble all that data together to help you control the system. Okay, so these are enabling technologies and they've come, they've become very much cheaper and very much better and rather revolutionary just in the last few years. In agriculture, for example, which nobody picked up as a water management issue, we've got new technologies. People are scanning things with drones now to see whether the crops are thriving, whether water is needed, whether nutrients are needed, and so on. So that's uh, an example of, of where a development has happened very quickly in, uh, in agriculture. And uh, it's very cheap. It's becoming quite common now. Uh, now, innovation, of course, covers a range of possibilities. And I, the ones I've got up here are actually, except for the, the uh, except for the measuring jug here, actually nothing to do with water. But I thought I put them up because they're interesting examples of tiny bits of innovation trivia, almost. The first one is exactly in, in, innovation trivia. It's um, on roads in Australia. They put up a sign, signs now with questions on to stop you falling asleep. So you play trivia as you drive along these very long highways in the Australian deserts. Uh, uh, as I say, it may save your life. Here's another tiny innovation. This is a system, I think it's in the States, where you can, if you're waiting in an airport lounge, you can print yourself a story to read while you wait, just instantly. So there it's. There's the story. Um, here's a nice measuring jug, very simple innovation. It's got the lines for how much you've got in it diagonally so that you don't have to keep tipping it up to check how much you've poured. And here's a, here's a memory stick with a, an indication of whether it's full or not on it, or you know, how full it is. Now, those are all tiny, tiny innovations, aren't they? Very tiny things that might kind of help you along. I think in the water sector we're looking for something a bit more fundamental. Um, how about this then? Um, hmm. An off-grid floating home. Um, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> um, well, um, this is a genuine design. I don't think it's ever been built. But um, the point here is that some innovation is rather wacky and need, one needs to think about the cultural aspects of it, not just the technological aspects. So I guess, you know, uh, another picture that was in this series showed a small, lonely little boy playing with a car in that, uh, in that space at the bottom. It would be awful. Um, but I wouldn't fancy his chances playing in the garden either. <laughs> We've got three flowers though, whoops. And a bird box, perhaps, or maybe it's a mail box. <laughs> Anyway, so maybe that's not what we want. Um, rather more realistically, this is an innovative 2015 California drought plan effort. Uh, you can see here, this is a reservoir, and um, they decided to try and control the evaporation from the surface of the reservoir. They would cover it in plastic balls, black plastic balls, the whole surface. So you can see they unloaded literally millions of these things. They float on the water, and it's supposed to stop the evaporation. Now, 
I don't know whether you think that's a good idea or not. I'm a bit worried about plastics in water, as I think a lot of us are these days. And I also don't think this is really the solution to managing drought. Um, but they are doing it. It's, it's a real picture. Sorry? Oh, yes, I beg your pardon. I took it out of the presentation I did for a Christmas lecture. <laughs> Now something more stupid. You win the prize. <coughs> Sharp eyesight. Um, okay, now I've been talking about different types of innovation, uh, some different types of innovation. The European Union, uh, European Water Sector, water sector um, published their own analysis of this, and they talked about water innovation not only being about new sustainable technologies, and I think the floating home and the plastic balls on the reservoir, neither of those are sustainable technologies. They also talk about new kinds of partnerships, new business models, new forms of water governance, and novel combinations of innovative ideas for improvements on current technologies and systems, that's the technology bit, all have a part to play. So there are various kinds of innovation that we're going to need here to tackle some of these water management problems. So I think they're right. We'll come back to the European Union again in a minute. But one of the problems we have is that there are so many stakeholders in the water sector. We're all stakeholders. We're all customers of water companies. Um, we make, some of us may work in the industry. Uh, some of us may be associated with governments. There may be academics, there's at least one academic in the room, I think. Um, lawyers, I haven't got on the diagram. Um, I put this up really to show you how clever I am mathematically. This is a, a far, you know Venn diagrams? There's only ever three circles on most Venn diagrams. This is a genuine five, uh, five set Venn diagram. Um, so there are a lot of stakeholders, and lots of different stakeholders, construction companies, as I say, lawyers, I suppose might come into the category of consultants and independent experts. Uh, you know what the government thinks of experts these days, of course. But there are a large number of stakeholders. In Scotland, um, and I, I, I'm afraid the research I'm going to talk to you about in a minute was done mostly in England, but the, in Scotland we have a set of stakeholders which include um, the, the people there on the, on the right-hand side of the screen, the Scottish Parliament, the Scottish Water, which is a company, um, various regulators, quite a number of regulators, in fact. Um, and um, again, I'm not going to go into details of this, but there are a very large number of stakeholders. The ones there are just um, the, the, the ones we've named, but we've got people like voluntary agencies, charities, for example, as well. So you have to start to think about who's centrally involved. Now, I've put some of them on here. Um, so people who are groups who are at the middle of managing the water sector would be the water companies in England and Scotland. Some also have responsibility for, for sewerage and dirty water treatment. We've got the regulators of what, or the Scottish Environmental Protection Agency, or the Drinking Water Inspectorate, and various others. We've got, again close to the middle, we've got what are called here tier one contractor, contractors, people who build things, people who repair pipes, people who build tunnels, and so on. We've got government departments, we've got uh, universities, research organisations, charities, professional bodies, customers, that's us jointly, trade associations who represent companies, and so on. So we've got a lot of people, some more centrally involved than others. A couple of years ago, three years ago, I did a, research, a piece of research about the water sector's views on innovation, trying to interview people in all of those different groupings. I uh, did quite a number of interviews and conversations. It's actually in practice very difficult to say who is somebody, what is somebody representing, because, as I said before, people are often in more than one group. You know, they can be a customer, we're all customers, but they also may be a government minister or uh, they work in a water company, whatever it might be. But I want to show you some of their views on innovation. So I said to, to them, well, we've got all these 
challenges facing the water sector. We've got flooding, we've got drought, we've got climate change, we've got pollution, we've got plastics, and so on. And I want to show you some of the statements that people made when I was talking to them. So when I asked them what innovation was, quite a number of people came up with very abstract ideas. So they say things like, well, it's achieving expectations from water that can meet user and environmental use and environmental goals without costing more. <laughs> right. um, a structured response to mitigate risk. Oh, dear. Um, sustainability, well, yes. Yes, I think that's important. Uh, this is quite interesting, this one. Most people think it's about incremental change within comfort zones of recognising the limits of existing systems. This is so we get improvements in billing systems and reductions in debtor days as significant innovations. This person said it's not. That was actually somebody from a charity organisation. So we've got some challenges here to what innovation actually is. Um, they do talk about occasionally about concrete ideas, and by that I don't mean built ideas, I mean something rather more tangible. And you can see here they're starting to talk about big data, which is the Internet of Things and so on. Um, using water smarter more than once, which is recycling, as somebody mentioned there. Um, using new technology like mathematical modeling, for example. Um, it, trying to simulate what's going on in a whole city in terms of where's the water coming from, going to, who's it being used by, and so on. This one I like, this was an ecologist. She said um, innovation is uh, to do with DNA analysis of newts in water. And you know newts are very important, certain types of newts, because they hold up housing development. Great crested newts. You can't develop housing if you find great crested newts there. And greater crested newts can only be found in person at certain times of the year. So this is a real nuisance for housing developers. Um, because they have to wait maybe up to a year before they can find out if there are any newts there. So somebody's now discovered you can find the newt DNA in the water. And great, you can develop the housing now um, immediately. Um, assuming there are no newt, there's no newt DNA there. So those are kind of concrete ideas. Now, the point about this is that innovation covers this vast spectrum of possibilities from things like charging mechanisms. Okay, how do you get your bill from your water for your water would be an innovation, according to some people. Or how do you communicate with people would be another. Um, and in the middle here, we've got things which are rather techy. Wastewater treatment, recycling, network control through the Internet of Things. As we go towards the right-hand side of this diagram, we've got things that are starting to talk, talk about make really big changes in the way the water is managed. Right through, got, oops, sorry. Um, we've got things like um, integrated management of water, energy, and food together, which is something I'm going to come back to in a minute, and complete organisational change, which would be something like, well, you know, you all just get on and get your own water. That would be a complete organisational change. <laughs> or we'll sell it, and if you can't pay for it, you can't have it. That would be a particular challenging uh, organisational change. I often, when I was teaching students, undergraduates, I used to say, take out the word water and replace it by air, and think well, that's reasonable. You know, you can only have the air if you can pay for it. Okay, now water is also important, but yet we don't say that for water. We don't say if you can't. Paper, you can't have it, do we? At least not completely. Okay. I don't know if any of you have been to Japan, but they sell oxygen in machines at the side of the road. Okay. Now, um, so here's an example of trying to manage two things together. This is a, a, a theoretical one. This is in China, where they're doing masses of innovation on water, actually, uh, often led by UK companies. For example, but this is a, a vertical forest, obviously built around uh, housing. Um, it's perhaps a better option than the floating thing in the draw in the, in the water. But um, um, the point is, it's not only the hardware; it's the management systems that we use. Now, integrated management of water, energy, and food together. As I said, we've got all these challenges happening at the same time. It's no good. 
managing one part of the water system if something else is adversely affected. Okay, and then we have complete organisational change. Now, the point is, when you ask people in the water sector if they think there's a problem with innovation, however it's defined, I said yes, no, maybe, and, and most people say yes, there's a problem. But people in the large water companies who actually are managing a lot of this system are, are rather more likely to say maybe. I mean, they're not convinced that there is a problem, and that's an interesting one. Uh, a slight digression. When I was um, doing the, um, when I was advising Gloucestershire County Council after the flood in 2007, I interviewed somebody from the relevant water company. I know this has been recorded. I'll say it anyway, it was Sam Trent in, in England, and I interviewed somebody very senior in the company. I said, was there a problem in the 2007 event when 240,000 people had lost their water supply and the army had to be brought in? And he said, no, there wasn't a problem. I said, well, how does that work? And he said, it didn't touch our bottom line. <laughs> okay. Now, that's an interesting question of perspective. That is, what we're saying here is it's, it's Despite, you know, droughts, in that case it was not a drought, it was the, the pumping station was flooded, the treatment plant was flooded rather, um, it's business as usual. Minor tweaks are going to be enough to see us through. So let's keep making these minor adjustments. And I think we have to think whether that is actually true. Now, those people who said there was a problem, they talked about what kind of problem it was. And people started to say things like, well, they're creativity problems. You know, you can't think about it in this way. Um, people get uncomfortable. And of course, there are public health risks associated with certainly drinking water and food and, and so on, if you, if you tweak around with that. Um, so previously untried solutions, as somebody said, innovation and so on, have uh, got to be tried, they make people uncomfortable. Um, so I won't go through all of this. Some people said the UK was a world leader in water and environment 15 years ago, 17 or 18 years ago now. It's now lost it, which is a bit disappointing. Um, those people who thought there might not be a problem, they said things like this. Limited innovation isn't a problem because the industry is fit for purpose. So it does what it needs to do, so let's not change it. Um, and, um, yes, yeah, some consultants and contractors are innovative, some are not. That's kind of okay. Um, okay, so the, is there a problem? Maybe. Now, what is the problem? I started to ask them, what's the actual problem? And they said things like, water's too cheap. Um, UK contractors, builders don't know what they're doing. Um, we don't have any way of testing things. This is an interesting one. Um, the interface between hard and soft science Oh, lost a bit somehow. Um, is, uh, I was going to say, interface between hard and soft science is problematic. What's happened there? Sorry about that. What's the sentence there? Um, so there are certain statements there about what the challenges are. And here's some more specific ones. Uh, we've got aging infrastructure. Our pipes are leaking. Somebody mentioned that earlier. Um, we've got um, centralised networks and treatment. We've got areas, areas of the world with inadequate sanitation. We've got rivers vanishing through over-abstraction. We've got carbon dioxide emissions, climate change related things. We've got flooding as a, uh, as a serious risk. And then where, where is the problem coming from? Well, quite a lot of people said it's the water company's fault, principally. Uh, and they talked about water companies being risk averse, they're not willing to innovate because there's too much vested in it. Uh, you may be aware, certainly in England, may, many of the water companies are owned by pension um, companies and they don't want big changes, they just want a steady 2% return on their money. They don't actually want to see big changes in ownership or technology and so on. So, um, they're only interested in making money perhaps. Um, they don't share ideas, they're monopolistic. Then there's some things here about universities. Uh, it's too difficult to talk to universities, so we won't get innovation. Clever people, the language is too complicated. 
there were some harsher statements, I have to say, uh, about universities, which when I gave this talk, well, a version of it somewhere else did not go down very well in the University, University College London, I have to say. Um, so there are various problems. Um, people say that these problems are internal to the water sector. And again, I won't go through all of these. Um, the important thing is, though, that so if we just pick up this statement here, transnational corporations and many of our water companies, not actually Scotland's water company, but in, elsewhere in the UK, um, they only embrace sustainability as long as it doesn't change the overall purpose, which is to grow faster and benefit a small number of shareholders. So there is regulation on how much water companies can pay their shareholders or how much they can charge their customers specifically, but uh, um, it perhaps doesn't truly engage with sustainability and the management of water across the piece. Now, some people blame other people, and basically, uh, I'm not going to go through all of these, but everybody, depending on where they are in that five-part Venn diagram, they will blame somebody in another sector. Okay, so it's never, the problem is never with them, it's with some other part of the system. <coughs> And, um, yes, this is the university one. Uh, there's one thing about universities here. There's, in, they are, they are um, higher education is not properly managed to do applied research. <laughs> Whether the university people here might differ from that. Um, oh, and then here, one of the research councils who fund research is an easy source than, than taking money from, from companies and they don't require you to do very much for it. So you don't apply to work with a company. If you're doing research on the water environment, you get your money from research council where you can do something entirely theoretical. Okay, and what's the solution? Well, here we are. One analysis here by somebody called Spate in 2015 talked about possible solutions. I'm not going to deal with all of this because I don't agree with them. I think this is not enough. Now, what we've got here is, oh, and he said, yeah, what's the solution? The water companies say, well, we need more money. Of course, they do. Um, you know, various things we could do. We could stimulate innovation with investment and so on and so on. More blue skies thinking, how do you get it and so on. Change the regulators' um, approach and so on. Um, the most important thing here is what we're dealing with here is a wicked problem. Now, this is a phrase which has become very fashionable in the media in the last 12 months. And I'm sure you've all heard about heard the phrase wicked problems being used, yes? Yeah. Well, you, if you really would, in your public conversation now, you can drop this in. This actually comes out of the, oops, sorry, it comes out of the um, 1970s um, from some two planners, American planners, in 1973. And the characteristics of a wicked problem are on the screen here. It's a problem that is not well understood, it's complex, it's got physical and scientific and human and sociological dimensions where if you do something somewhere at one time, it affects somebody somewhere else another time. So I was talking earlier to um, one of the committee here and they said, well, uh, my daughter lives in Pugley and it's great there, they've solved the flooding uh, through some mechanism. And I said, well, where's the water gone? I said, I can tell you where the water's gone, it's now in Gloucester. Okay, but they've stopped it going into Bugley. So what happens in one place and time affects what happens somewhere else. Many different stakeholders, as we've seen, they don't agree about what's important. It could be stopping people dying for a lack of water, or it could be generating money for shareholders, or it could be protecting newts. Um, any of those things. They use ambiguous terminology in different ways and they can't agree if the problem's been solved. In fact, they can't even agree what the solution would look like. And here we can see great Scott here um, grappling with a wicked problem. This is actually a photograph taken during the 2007 flooding of Gordon Brown. Um, and here we can see another great mind grappling with wicked problems in that flood event as well. Right, now the important thing about wicked problems, and again I'm going to show you something for your pub conversation in a minute, is you have to think about them in different ways, novel ways, and what you have to do is think about solutions not that are the perfect solution, but something that is rather better, or 
worse rather than absolute. And you've got to make decisions even though you're uncertain about things. Now, in fact, I think Prince Charles perhaps he struggles with this. Um, in fact, the latest, again, your pub conversation, we're now into super wicked problems, which hasn't yet got to the media, but has some other characteristics, like time is running out, those who cause the problem are also trying to provide a solution, there's no body really in charge, and we're only trying to solve things in the short term. So that's the characteristics of hyper-wicked problems. Now, water management problems are hyper-wicked problems, all of them. Okay. Now let's just have a look at some solutions. I like this um, picture. Innovation that we need to do this often occurs where one or more groups overlaps, or sectors or science, uh, different sciences overlap. So let's have a look at overlaps. Now here's an example of an overlap. This is a, a I've forgotten this chap's name, but he's an amazing in math inventor. He's one of his overlap technologies is you put um, um, a, a computer screen on the front of your microwave so you can play games while you wait for your coffee to lunch. So, I'm not talking about that kind of interface. Um, I'm talking about all sorts of other interfaces, one of which is between different groups of people. And here's a great thing coming out of the University of Oxford. It's a large climate modeling experiment, and it uses your computer. So because the computing power that's needed to tackle some of those things is so large, you just sign up, and it uses your computer to, to churn some of the numbers when you're not using it. Here's a, an innovation that's looking at drought implications for animals, and it, again, draws on you. Non-specialists working with specialists. Uh, this one, it's, they've got cameras set up, this is in the Serengeti, and thousands of people look at the images, and they help by classifying. They say, well, that looks like a, I don't know what it is, it's not a bat, is it? But a, you know, it's an hard bark. I don't know, it's not an hard bark, but it's a whatever it is. And you type it into your computer, and gradually, using your data, big data, and this overlap area of population, things are being improved. I do have some concerns when it's being done with, uh, with people, because they are now asking for people to spot whether people are on the move, trying to get away from drought in the Sudan. They say, look at these satellite images. You, as an unskilled user, have a look. Can you spot a temporary encampment of a group of people on the move? Okay, so some of these are a bit worrying. Um, again, freshwater watch, you can join projects, you can go and sample water on a scale never seen before. The Internet of Things is dealing, delivering all sorts of things. There's a f flood, um, flooding is one where all sorts of data is being flooded, uh, pulled together, which is telling us things about flooding in real time that we could not have in 2007 in Gloucestershire. It didn't exist technology. Um, so you get flood, you know, monitoring of things all the time by little sensors on people's gate posts and that kind of thing. Um, and we've got community science projects where people are looking at mapping wetland vegetation and so on. And, uh, I'm sure there are equivalents in Scotland, this one's in North England. Um, now, there are some issues about whether we actually want this kind of technology and is it actually answering the big questions. Um, or is it just, as uh, Thoreau says here, means to an unimproved end? Um, now, here's an example, another example of something that's completely bonkers. Um, a smart, innovative city with water central to it. Here we go, we've got vertical walls, uh, we've got, these are food harvesting devices apparently, we've got these children very close to this train line, and so on, it's uh, completely mad. I don't think uh, a city designed with, to manage the water environment effectively would look like that. But some, we are closing on some of these things. So I don't know any, how, whether any of you have come across these things. These are really smart toilets. Have any of you indulged? No? Um, they're already in London. Um, they use 80% less energy and 84% less water. They're, just, they're a bit like an aeroplane toilet. So they massively cut water use, and they're already in use in London. Um, but what we really want is these solutions, these innovations that are addressing more than one thing at a time in these wicked problems. We want them addressing more than one thing at a time. So here's 
uh, in this case, agriculture, um, water, and air, in this, this particular case, various ways of thinking about that. We've got to address more than one thing at a time. Now, here's a, one close to here, addressing more than one thing at a time. It's a distillery, I don't know which one it is. They're recovering nutrients and energy from wastewater in a distillery. Okay, so they're addressing three things there, at least three things. Uh, water use, nutrients, and energy, cleaning up the water as well, and generating food, or drink in this case. Um, here's a, a young company, very young company in London, where they are uh, recycling water, growing through fish ponds here. They've got plants on the roof, uh, sorry, plants on the roof up here, um, fish ponds <coughs> down here, and uh, people having a cup of coffee while the whole thing functions. Um, but that's actually operating now, and it's generating uh, food in an urban environment using less space and cleaning up the water at the same time. This is right hot off the press. This is a company called Airponics. They won a prize last week, because I was, at the, uh, was one of the judges. Um, they are growing organic quality food with no soil at all, using a kind of mist system that just puts mist and water and nutrients onto the plants, almost vertical. And um, it uses a thing like an inkjet printer. And it massively reduces the amount of water, 15% of the normal water input. And you get the food no fossil fuels, almost no fossil fuels, and so on, and 10 times the output on conventional farming in the same area. Okay, um, there's another one there from Harriet Watts, which was also won an award last week. But, uh, so, I'm going to skip across a couple of these now, but what we want this, this kind of thing in, in water is to have it operating at city scale. Big systems thinking, big changes. And the things that we've got to do, we've got to make this work, we've got to have solutions that are, if you like, integrated <coughs> systems. I've put here water, I've got transport, food, energy, waste management, soil, and so on. They've got to be recycling solutions. They've got to be low energy, otherwise you're going to add to the climate change problem. They've got to be long-lasting, durable, like bubblegum, but also flexible, and they've got to be resilient to shocks. Something goes wrong in the system, a big flood, for example, we can't control the weather, but if you get a big flood, it's got to be resilient. And I think you have to ask these questions about what we're doing at the moment, about what I've called here bounce back ability. In Gloucestershire, in 2007, the communication systems failed, not because they were flooded, but because people's phones and radios ran out of batteries and ran out of energy because the, um, the flood knocked out one of the um, electricity substations. So we go for a high-tech solution. We have to be very careful about whether it will bounce back in the event of a hydrological or water failure. And what I would, coming to the end of what I want to say now, what I think we should be going for is what we call nature-based solutions, things that mimic nature, things that um, bring us nature uh, and have natural features and bring those into cities and landscapes. So those kind of things, solutions that mimic or look like nature and are based on nature are going to be more resilient. There's a couple of examples here, one in the southwest, um, where counterintuitively it works out this is about soci the sociology of water management. Water companies pay farmers not to use fertilizer because that is cheaper than treating the, the water coming down the river when it's full of fertilizer. Okay, so they are working in partnership together to try and make this work, to try and use a nature-based solution. Um, and I think this is my last example here. There's a company called Albion Water that's recently been bought by Bristol Water, actually. Um, they are, instead of just providing water and wastewater services in an area, if you lived in uh, an area managed by Albion Water, they would manage the water, the waste, the energy, and the landscaping all together. You would just pay one charge for that. And the onus is on them to reduce, to help you reduce your use of everything. Because if they can make more money by you being um, more careful. It's very popular with residents. 
Okay, now, just to finish, we have an innovation landscape in this country that according to the Dowling report done in 2015, it looks like this. All these different organisations involved in innovation in Britain. It's all right, I'm going to lose this bit, this pink bit, shortly, so that'll be fine, won't it? That'll make it simpler, we're going to lose the EU. Um, but we, we've still got all this complexity here, and I have to ask you if you think this is helpful in managing innovation and stimulating innovation, because I, actually I don't. What is helpful is if we actually start to influence the context in which genuine collaboration, these cross-sectoral, cross-group things operate, build capacity for people to think differently. That's what will enable innovation. It's not about giving them information. It's not about exchanging information or bring, just bringing people together. It's this bit here, influencing the whole context, making us think completely differently about water uh, and all those other sectors of the economy. And by developing partnerships, where in this case, the cat's got at the water supply by working in partnership with the dog. Thank you very much.